Hey, how y'all doing, man? Sorry I missed last week. Uh, we I called in actually sick on uh, on Wednesday for class, so or, uh, I didn't make it to class and I uh, wasn't feeling great, so I decided not to do a Friday here. But I am back. Uh, hi, this is John. Uh, I teach at University of California, the University of Cal California Merced, <laughs> and I teach a class called Dungeons and Dragons Skills IRL, which is part of our Spark Seminars GE course. And um, I use this, these Fridays as kind of a way to reflect on what we were doing in the class, what what, what we got up to, um, stuff like that, you know. Um, I really like to kind of have it as a way to, I don't know, like, just think about, like, reflect, you know, get get some ideas. Some of my students like to come on here and uh, definitely like to, like, kind of use it as a way to refresh their memories of what they missed. Uh, it doesn't make up for the class at all, but uh, it... Uh, a good activity so this week we had two activities uh on monday we were visited by steve kenson uh steve kenson if you do not know steve kenson let me go actually i can pull the assignment but i'm gonna do that when i pull i can pull the assignment i actually have that i actually do give my students assignments on occasion right um and let me go and make this a tab big here i can kind of show you guys what i did See here, let me get the first one. Freeze. Let me go and have this. Sure. Let's see, here we go. Okay. Wait, what is that? Oh, I don't need that. So, um, when my students visit with someone, we don't just like, we don't. I don't just have them like meet the person and start asking questions. We actually like try to like engage with some stuff. So here is the kind of primer I gave them. Um, and they're actually required to read this stuff. Uh, at least they should. Um, I have links to Steve's website here. This is some, um, he's been a game designer for decades. So Steve's been working since like the nineties. Um, and I try to give them some examples of stuff with like, with always a lot of work. So here's like his stuff on RPG Geek. And you can actually go through and see like all the stuff he's worked on linked items here. I, I, I had no idea that Steve worked on this much Aberrant stuff, which is really cool. That's one of my favorite RPGs from high school. But you can go through and see all this cool stuff he's worked on. There's 57 pages of this. Um, some articles he's had in magazines, etc. And so let them kind of know the guy has a history. You can go through and dig through that. Uh, where he works right now, is, which is Green Ronin. So they can go and look up all the stuff he did, he's done for Green Ronin. Uh, you know, get some previews and they can go and dig through here if they want to. Uh, and then he here's a link to Mutants and Masterminds, which is his primary, uh, what he's like, his big opus, if you will, of work. He's been doing it for a while. And uh, he's a producer of Blue Rose and he his awards. Um, you can actually pull, I didn't want to pull, I don't like to, t I don't like to have students, the thing is, I don't want students just to be like, hey, I'm like, hey, here's Steve Kenson, here's his name. And they'll go up and look and they'll find like, they'll find whatever. Yeah, it is a hell of a list. Oh, dude, Kenson's like, I'll put that chat, I'll put that link in the chat real quick if you want to read through Steve's uh, stuff here. But that's his stuff. It, it's a, it's ridiculous. Uh, going back to Shadowrun. He's written several novels for Fossa, um, for uh, Mech Warrior, Shadowrun, uh, Crimson Skies, even, which was like another fun game for my that I really love. I, if you don't play the Crimson Skies, the Crimson Skies board game, it's amazing. Hmm. Um, honestly, like a precursor to X Wing, but um, so this gives them a lot to work with and kind of dig through. The problem is if I give them a name, Steve Kenson, they'll go and Google Steve Kenson. One, a lot of people will find, will find the wrong Steve Kenson. This has happened several times where they've looked up the completely wrong person and like allocated things to them. I, I know because if you Google my name, one of the top results is this lawyer that like gets some of their car back in like St. Paul or something like that. Um, so it's like, you have to be kind of careful with that. Two, they might just start digging through Twitter and Twitter is kind of a minefield uh, to say the least. So I don't want them to do that. And then, um, but I, I'd rather them kind of look at things that like actually hold some weight to them. Um, and so looking at like the professional website's a good thing, looking at the, pub, the current publisher he's mainly working for, his main products. Um, and hopefully from there they can go and find some cool stuff. And I try to give them some names of some big materials like Shadowrun, Crimson Skies, and Mech Warrior. Those are not small properties. Um, and then I give him some, some links to interviews he's done. So here's Dice Geeks. And then here is a recent one he did for um, GMS Magazine. And so I want to try to give them ones that are uh, really pertinent. Uh, Steve's really into superhero role-playing games. Like, it's like, he's a big comic book geek, too. So, like, that's kind of fun. I, didn't, I knew he was in comics. I didn't know how big he was into comics. Um, but he's into it. Like, he's 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 a big Bronze Age guy. 
grew up with that. And then um, with all that material, they go through there to submit five questions um, for Steve. And so I was like, you know, your questions can focus on design approaches. So he's a designer. You know, what about that element are you interested in? Like, do you want to hear about how you got started? Do you want to hear about his process, what his philosophies are? Um, a lot of students were like, what's the major issue trying to, because like, what's the major issues trying to like superhero uh, role playing games? And because that's a very different, that's a very hard genre compared to like, like Dungeon Dragons fantasy adventure games. Um, the questions can focus on design approaches, how the industry has changed. I mean, he's been in it for 30 years, so that's a big thing um, for 30 plus years. Um, and how to navigate the space as a historically marginalized identity. So Steve is, is gay. Uh, and it's pretty, um, he was pretty, he was pretty open about that. Uh, really open about that, actually, and, and talked a lot about how he, he, so the students asked him interesting questions on that front. And uh, most is kind of like, what was that experience like in the 90s? Because it's a very different time. The 90s, being, being gay in the 90s, um, even even for myself as like a straight white male, like, you know, looking back at it, like, you can see the difference in 30 years. Right? It's shocking. And, and Steve was like, it's it's radically different. Right? It really, it really is dramatically different. Um, but he talked a little bit about uh, how... He never really, it never really ran up against an issue with it. Like nothing, no one ever was like, oh, we don't hire you because of that. He said it was actually more of himself censoring. He said his biggest hurdle with a lot of that was himself. But it was really interesting to talk about that. And I, and I, I want to say I, I highly applaud his candor with that and being honest with the students about that. And that actually was like a really good, um, that was something I didn't expect. Honestly, none of us really expected, but it was good. Um, and we talk about that, how we kind of, sometimes we do hide our identities. Like I, I for, for me personally, it's, it's not the same, but like, I, I've really had, I hadn't been really honest about being disabled for a long time. Um, I could, you know, you can mask it, you can get away with it. Um, no one knows, but, but this was the assignment. And then, um, the, I, I try to, <laughs> I try to give time. I try to let each student ask a question or pick one question from each student. Uh, one of the problems we run into is there is some overlap. Some students ask the same thing, like, what's it like to work on big properties? How'd you get started? Uh, what's the differences in the industry? What was it like living through the pushback against Blue Rose? Who's pushing back against Blue Rose? Um, stuff like that is pretty interesting. Uh, but Steve's also, like, gave very complete answers. He was very, um, he had a lot to say about everything. And it was very thoughtful answers and took his time. And I, and I have a lot of respect for that. So we didn't get through all the students' questions, but we did get some good insights. Um, and uh, it was a great visit. Like I, and, and Steve said it was great. I, uh, you know, he said it was pleasant. He was, uh, the the people that visit the class didn't be surprised at the, the students' questions. Because a lot of them are outside. A lot of them have never looked at role playing games prior to this class. So they have that. Um, but they are well they are well aware of LGBTQIA uh, plus issues. Okay, so, uh, but they want, you know, they're looking mostly at stuff in the last, like, 10 years mostly versus 30 years back, which is a big, big shift. So I have a lot of respect um, for what Steve uh, shared and uh, a lot of love for what he did because I thought it was a very, very good class as my students were. Um, and I, I, do, I do vet the questions. So, like, uh, some people were asking, you know, I, I try to throw in some of the softball kind of fun questions, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on them, but they're fun to break the ice and everything. So some students were like, what's your favorite, su what's your favorite superhero character? You know, how do you get, you know, why comic books? You know I mean? They they ask some questions like that. And that's cool. Like we should, you know, those are fun to have once in a while, but I don't want to spend a lot of time um, on stuff like that. I'd rather uh, spend time on the actual professional elements that we can get into. And, and Steve was very open about that. And he talked about starting as a game tester. That's where he started as a game tester. And uh, they were like, you know, you know a lot about this world. You want to write some shower and stuff? He's like, yeah, sure. Like, can we pay you? And he's like, what? You can pay me? You know, he was, he was kind of taken aback by it. It was cool. It was a cool story. Uh, uh, one of the questions that came up that was really interesting, too, was students asked him about the Satanic Panic because Steve's a bit older than me. He's about 10 years old than me. I'm not sure how, how old Steve is, exactly, but I think he's a little older than me. And he, his, it was interesting. His answer was like, yeah, my parents were religious, but they, they didn't really ever do this thing. I never really heard anything about it from them. He talked about tangentially, like he had friends who were forbidden from seeing him because he played D&D &D, um, or got kind of pulled out of the friend group. That was really interesting too. So we, so it was kind of cool to have uh, another person that bore witness to kind of the consequences of the satanic panic. Um, 
and you know to make students all think that like you know basically joseph laycock and myself are making this up just because blood kill they, they've heard from so i thought that was really cool um but yeah it was good it was, I, had a, I had a good time with steve and i really appreciate it so this was the assignment here and uh, you can kind of see what it was uh, i i really can't share the direct student uh, responses because it has their grades attached to it now but um this is the assignment i think it's pretty straightforward and i think it gives them enough information to work with and honestly the students were eager um, I also mentioned the way I handle it too is uh, I, t I also I ask uh, I ask the friends is there anything you want to talk about if there's something there's you want to talk about we won't talk about it okay totally cool totally game for that um, is there anything you want them to know ahead of time okay um, is there you know he was open I, I mean the dude was open book I have a lot I really appreciated that I wanted to make sure they were uh... and he asked them some questions I was very open about the last like 15 minutes of the session, 20 minutes of it, that him asked the questions to the students. And they were, um, you know, I think, I can't remember what he asked. I think he asked them about like what they like seeing in RPGs, like what they like about them. And I thought that was interesting because, uh, you know, he's in a unique position where Blue Rose, when it came out, was very different. It, it was very, it has a very queer friendly, just at least. The themes on it. And, and Steve didn't talk about some of the mistakes they made in the early Blue Rose. Like he, he talked about they had some issues with the way they represented trans people in it. He was like, yeah, I, you know, we messed up. And they were open about it and rectified it. And that's the way to deal with it, guys. If you are if you mess up on something, just like, hey, I messed up. Sorry. I, I'm still kind of figuring out how to do it myself. Um, that that stuff goes so far, man. Like, I swear, like, people don't know. But, like, if you, if you tell people, that, like, hey, you know, I'm still kind of learning and I made a mistake or I should have done better. You know, uh, it'll it goes over gangbusters, guys. So please do that stuff. So that was really interesting. Um, and uh, even this of being defensive or you know, oh how dare you? No, no, it's good. So uh, great visit. Very happy with that. That's kind of my assignments. But uh, I also heard the students saying like, if you know, if they're if they're not going to answer it, then they're not going to answer it. You know, and I like to have the conversations be as frank as possible, be as uh, open as possible. And hopefully have him back. You know, I'd love to have Steve back uh, in the future uh, and everything too. So totally cool. And I think I brought I brought a copy of um brought a copy of uh, Fantasy Age Second Edition because that's like the Steve's name is like the first name in that book. So that's so I wanted. I think it's alphabetical order, but like uh, he's still at the first name in the book. So I wanted to make sure they could see an actual book that he's done. But they looked at like the quick starts for Blue Rose, Muse Mastermind, and stuff like that. So they're, they're they have something familiar with them. Um, but yeah, that's where I'm kind of going with that and try to pull some history on it. But the more I will say as a guest, the more you give me like to work on, the, the more accurate because I have had stuff where I put something up and they figure, oh, you put that up. I didn't want that up. And it's like, I told, I asked you like, what do you want me to like put up? And I, I grabbed some stuff that looked pretty good, but I didn't know that was something you weren't interested in talking about. So and I haven't, I've only had that issue to happen once, like briefly. I was like, oh, okay, it's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, great. And we're looking forward to our visit with uh, D'Angelo Morello in a little over a week. Uh, uh, I think that's the 30th. Yeah, and D'Angelo has been very, very generous with us to give us, to let my students each have a copy, a PDF copy of Emerald Templars' RPG. So they're really, really looking forward to it. They're going to dig through that. So they give them quite a bit of content. Very cool. Oh, and that was a great question. People were asking uh, Steve, what's it like to work with licensed properties? He's worked with DC. He's worked with... Uh, Mech Warrior, Crimson Sky, Shadowrun. These are not small properties, so good stuff. But anyway, uh, so that was like the that was Monday session. Wednesday session was because we missed last Wednesday. Uh, we were covering Chapter Six of Dangerous Games then, and now we are. Uh, it's in the back of the book. Uh, we read seven and eight over the weekend, and then nine's coming up. Which nine is a um, nine's a conclusion. It's not really Chapter Nine, but it's the conclusion. And so I thought I would go kind of look at what students um, said about that all. Let me go ahead and pull. I can't see them because I have, I have it all zoomed in so you guys can see the stuff. Um, so chap let me talk about chapters 6, 7, 8 of Dangerous Games. So chapters 6, 7, 8 are the interpreting the pack. So the first part, the first five chapters of the book um, is history. Like it's all like, here's what happened. Here's the occurrences. Here's what these games are. Here's the advent of Dungeons and Dragons, kind of a brief history of it. 
Here is the advent of the moral panic. Here's like some of the major cases that happened where like where like Satanism and all this stuff was accused, the occult was accused. Here's where the shift happens when uh, Vampire the Masquerade comes out, the World of Darkness. I mean, we should talk about that a little bit. I had to kind of exp well, Vampire was a little harder for me to understand because like the issue with that um, was one playing monsters was a new thing, but two, White Wolf made an kind of like actively like was react was a reaction to the panic where like they actually embraced it. Um, and I had to show them the Book of Nod. If you haven't seen the Book of Nod, it's it's chapter and verse, but it's basically the Vampire Bible. It's there. It's the vampiric account of what happens during Genesis. And they were like, holy shit. I was like, yeah, you can see people get, this was like meant to make people mad. Like it's meant as a prop in the games where they advertise that, but like, come on guys. Like this is, this was provocative. And, and it's a good, it's a really good piece. It's a good, I, I told them the story, Kane's story, and they were like, holy shit. I was like, yeah, it's, it's, it's interpretive fiction. You know, it's, it's an interpretation of, a, of, this, of these events. So we, um, uh, what we made up, uh, but part two of the book is interpreting the panic where Laycock does his analysis. So what does this stuff mean? What's the situation? Like, what does he think? And that's another respect about the book was, and I, I also try to use the book to teach kind of argumentation. So you that's not a major thrust of the class. I'm like, hey, this is a really good example of how to do argumentation. Set the, the issue, set up all, put all the, put all the evidence on the board, put all the pieces on the board, and then be like, all right, now let me show you how to play this. And that's what he kind of does. And so chapter six is on how role-playing games create meaning. Uh, this section deals, oh, what's up? B. E, uh, yeah, it's it's a different, it's a different kind of time period. Um, the 90s and early 2000s, Dean evokes a group of tech, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, vampires are really different, a different breed of, of, of panic. Um, because you have the overlap of the real world versus like being a purely fantastical world like D and D is. Um, that was kind of the trip. Was it felt very real? Like they're trying to bleed into the world, which they are. Um, and then the different one, one of the things about vampire is that like it's not so much it's dystopian in the sense of like you know and like D and D stuff and like it's kind of based on Tolkien. So that's what we want to kind of have where things are very simple. But like vampire embraces the grayness, the darkness, the dirtiness. You know, and it has some problems with doing that too, but, but it, you know, it works. So, let me go back and look at like when my students here wrote this. So, chapter six, uh, this is the section um, how role playing games create meaning. Let me kind of get some of the takeaways they pulled. Um, one thing that this quote they used from the book is this means that fantasy worlds are not separate from the. This, this is a really key element that, that Laycock points out. Um, this means the fantasy worlds are not separate from the world of daily life, but have a relationship with it. These games have a relationship with us, like our, how I live my life. I mean, I, aside from me teaching this crap, but like, you know, I, I, you know, it does affect my daily life. Um, you know, I have decor in my house. I have things I think about in terms of these things. Um, because fantasy worlds are ultimately derivative of the world of daily life, they are reflections of this world and enable a, a reflection of this world. So this students, as people use RPG to help them cope with their real world issues, it also allows people to try different solutions before the real life. And that's a big thing. So these games are not pure fantasy. That's the major thrust that Laycock's trying to put. Like, these are not pure fantasy. And he argues, I think he kind of argues that ultimately nothing is really pure fantasy. It has some deep in, like, our, our actual lives. Um, much like how religion does. You know, and that's kind of the trip here is there's a lot of overlap, but it's not a religion. There's a difference there. There's a line that, that RPGs don't cross. Uh, Let's see here. Um, also, there's an inherent meaning in RPGs such as it shows development of the human mind. Okay. Um, babies are known to develop their cog cognition in areas related to these types of separate world worlds reflecting their reality. Playing RPGs is kind of like an actualization of, the, of this development half. That's interesting. Let's see what someone wrote here about chapter six. Um, uh, this kind of, they, the students describe it as an anti-structure, which is really interesting. Um, but they say, with a game like D&D, you can play the game and challenge social structures without any real consequences. Not about, I mean, yeah, there's no, the consequences are minuscule, about miss work, you know, or something like that. Um, one big concept we get into in this, uh, in this section is liminality. So these are like the in-between spaces. Um, uh, yeah, like, the idea is that 
you have these spaces that are cutting between. So like there's, there's, there's like there's like a cow called liminal spaces, and it's usually like like hallways and stuff like that, or waiting rooms. So it's space between spaces. And in liminality, in this is like kind of the development of the mind, where you have like teenagers are kind of like, well, they're not children, but they're also not adults. They're kind of more childish, but they're kind of adultish. So like, which one are they? And they're kind of both simultaneously, neither. And so that's a big thing with get with um, the liminality that separates. Uh, the game as the player by the real world there's a liminality there for us like we, we occupy both simultaneously so when i play a game you know i get hungry you know that's the real world uh if something someone does in the game might make me mad and i might be cur with them there that's a that's a real world situation so yeah um so this meaning isn't just isolated to the game the meaning bleeds out of the game and into the real world the real world bleeds into the game so they, they're not nice um they, 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 they pull in Tolkien's description comparison of the escape prisoner versus the flight of the deserter. Um, so you have someone who's trying to desert reality, trying to like leave reality. But then you also have people that are confined to a shitty reality that, that use their mind to get out of it. And that's a big one for me is I think that's why RPGs are so popular these days is that a lot of people are trying to escape. They're trying to like find ways out, like make it so there's a world that feels like we can actually grasp it, like hopes out there somewhere. Um... Hmm. Let's see here. What else we got? This is chapter six here. This these students were mentioned by its enticement of adolescence. Um, to introduce self identity to teens who are trying to figure out their own. That's a big. That's a big appeal. To kids. I mean, a lot of my students are interested. Like a lot. You know, we get a lot of um, my class. I've looked at this number, the numbers in the past, and I, I haven't looked at the numbers this semester. But like, I'll, I'll probably try to do it next semester for sure. But I get a lot of students that are uh, queer identities in my class, like a lot. Um, there's, we have an idea about, about the percentages on campus, but my class tends, tends about like five, ten percent higher than average. And it's freshmen, so like uh, these are new students and such like that. So um, yeah, they're, they're new students basically. And so self-identity is a big thing these games appeal about is that people like people like them because you're you can kind of play that in. By all means, I mean, your character sheet is literally like, you know, you can, it's like fill out the, the form of the doctor's office, but you can say what the fuck you want. Pretty cool. Um, let's see here, the idea of infinite scenarios. Um, they can experience different outcomes or personas that best match what they wish to become society or what they're just curious about society. That's a big thing. You know, Laycock does spend some time talking about, we didn't even talk about it much in the past, but like, the crappy sessions. Like, where, you know, I mean, I would just when I, when I was playing in middle school and early in high school was, you know, you, you go murder hobo, you know, you go and you beat up people and steal and you're just a menace. And so, well, why? You know, why do that? Is that what the reality I want? And the answer is it's not the reality I want, but it's a reality I don't understand. You know, it's foreign to me. But it's, it's the idea of like that much violence is this kind of a way for me to try to experience or understand it to some degree. Um, you know, play with it before without it being like real world violence or understand violence even in my own life or something like that too. Um, they, they also got really interested in students that uh, are invested. The students got really interested in the idea of like people that like, uh, in this case was this, um, It was fascinating, like kind of learning about the ideas of magic and practice and ritual through D and D. Not that it taught you ritual, but the idea of ritual, or the idea of magic, and then went and looked into magic outside of, like, in, you know, like different religious practices and check that out. And so there's an idea that people go into it, find something new, and then oh, what's that? What's that? I wonder that that is what the basis of that the real world is, and go out and play with it and come back. And I think this is true of identity, um, whether that's religious identity. And Lake Hawk only speaks religious identity. I've had it explained to students before. Because that's his field. He doesn't talk about gender identity or sexual identity, racial identity. That's not his field. Um, but religious identity certainly is. And so there's this kind of idea that that well, like these kids went out and found, you know, witchcraft and paganism and all this crap because of D and D. And it's like, yeah, they did. But D and D didn't teach them paganism. D and D didn't t teach them witchcraft. It just taught them like, hey, there's a thing out there called witchcraft. We, we show off a really fantasy, fantastical, you know, BS version of it. Like, if you go look at Dean, it's like, it's like saying, like, um, you know, 
in Dungeons and Dragons, like actually like the, the the like the kingdoms in Dungeons and Dragons are reflective of real world kingdoms. They're not. They're pretty mellow, actually, pretty easy, pretty like hierarchical and in order, all things considered. So that's kind of interesting. Let's see what we've got in here. I think that's a pretty good spread of chapter six about how they create meaning. Um Look at chapter seven, which was how the imagination became dangerous. This is this is where the shit starts to hit the fan for like Hawking. He really he really goes to it. Um, one of the issues is that the the main criticism of Dungeons and Dragons and role playing games comes from the New Christian Right, uh, which is largely evangelical. The New Christian Right is a broader broader movement, and what happens there is. The cornerstone of that kind of movement is that the Bible is literal. It's not interpretive. It's literal word of God verbatim. And it, it's the truth. And so that that sense of interpretation, because they say the truth is an interpretation, that then leads into how they interpret everything. It is written is written as a way to be completely true. So Dungeons and Dragons saying that there is these demons and devils that are in the book, you know, just fiction in the game. They're saying, you know, their interpretation of that is that that is what they literally are teaching. Uh, you know, when Jews priests says break the law, they're advocating for you to go break the law. Not that it's a story about economic downturn and like, you know, having to go to criminality just to survive and feed your family. No, it doesn't do that. They're, you know, it's not, it's, it can't be an economic critique. It has to be about, you know, actively trying to break the law. And so, um, this is kind of the, the issue that, that kind of comes up. Um, let's see here. Go into, I'm going to find some other students real quick here. What do we got one there? You can meet me, let's see, yeah, right. Um, one of the things that came up too in this section is there's is there seems to be a distinct failure amongst adults to distinguish imagination to understand imagination. Um, there's been a lot of people bringing this up lately. But there's there's a very there's a high lack of studies on play in adults, like just play. Um, as an adult that plays games and runs games and enjoys play, like, it's hard to find stuff on it, guys. Like, a lot of it's focused on children. Um, but the idea of how adults fail imagination is really So, Laycock brings up this example. Um, let me see if I can find it quick here. Is the, uh... Let me see if I can find the, the, the part of it. Yeah, so he's talking about, uh, this is out of Colorado. Second grader, Alex Evans was suspended uh, for tossing an imaginary grenade into an imaginary box. Another grenade in the box exists. He was playing a game of make-believe called Rescue the World. So he said, uh, on record, he said, I'm playing this game, I'm gonna rescue the world. That's the name of my game. Okay. The box contained a terrible evil that his grenade destroyed before it could contaminate the world. This is what his story was. The school was concerned that this game violated its policy prohibiting weapons, whether real or play. Uh, in a television interview, Alex told her boys, and I quote, I cannot believe I got disbended. Not only could he not pronounce his punishment, <laughs> little cop gas, right? But he could not understand why he was being dis disciplined for something that was only imaginary. Uh, in Pennsylvania, a five-year-old was suspended for taking, talking about a toy gun that fired soap bubbles. Just for talking about this toy gun that could fire soap bubbles. Yeah, I know, it's just a little bubble gun, boom, right? Got suspended for just talking about it. And then, and a fifth grader was searched in front of her classmates for bringing a piece of paper that resembled a gun. Uh, in Maryland, a boy received a two-day suspension for biting a Pop-Tart into the shape of a gun. And upon hearing this, the NRA awarded the boy a lifetime membership, of course. So, there is, okay, so there's this panic about violence, and, and guns represent violence, by all means. Okay, cool. Actual guns are, are, are there for violence. Um... And a lot of this comes off the Sandy Hook shooting and various other kind of like uh, things like that. But then there's this early and there's this claim in early psychology, it's like a, uh, 
analytics that Clint from Freud and uh, Paget. I don't know. I don't know the neighbor. Uh, that young children cannot discern between fiction and truth. They can't. And uh, and there was advising that you shouldn't read fairy tales because it was a form of lying to children. Okay. Um, Tolkien does the other way. He's like, no, you need to do that. They have an appetite for wonder. Um, and cognitive scientists say you need to help them wonder and play make believe. It goes a really good long ways. Um, but then there is this, there is this issue, and kids can do it pretty well. Um, for young children, however, the imaginary worlds seem just as important and appealing as the real ones. If not, as scientists, you just think that children can't tell the difference between a real world and imaginary. World. It's just that they don't see any particular reasons for preferring to live in the real one. Fair enough. Um, and there's some kind of interesting, like, kind of like, uh, like, like stories regarding this. And one of them is that, like, the this kind of idea of this puppet. So you can have like a kid. You, you know, I got a puppet here, and I, uh, you know, like how it play with a kid, and. Like, I can have the puppet, like, bite the kid, and the kid will say, ow, even though you're not really, like, like you're not really putting any grip on them. They're, you're not, like, pier piercing the skin. But they'll say, ow, they'll play along with it. And they'll say, so-and-so bit me, the puppet bit me. But did the puppet really bite you? No, it didn't. They understand the difference. They can they can go beyond that, but they'll play along with it. But with the with the, the adult things, really they look into this experiment where they had, uh, they asked the adult to fill a bottle of tap water. Okay, they go to the tap adult water. And then put a label with a sign in it. And adults, the adults that filled the bottle and, and placed the label on it would refuse to drink it. Even though they know they are the ones with the bottle of tap water, that it does not have sign in it. So there's this imagination kind of breakdown where they can only interpret things literally. That's 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 the dangerous element of imagination. This is where Lake kind of going with this. This is where it gets dangerous. Um yeah. Yeah. I, on Playgrounds Across America, the imagination is not privileged as a separate kind of morality. Uh, and in the era of school shootings, there's been an attempt to impose consequences on what children imagine. Um, just as Alex with the grenade, D&D enthusiasts couldn't understand why they thought D&D magic was real. Um... But the idea of banishing imaginary weapons was expected to mitigate the dangers of real weapons. So that's the thing, is let's get rid of the imaginative elements. That way it gets rid of the real ones. Like there, it doesn't, that, that's all, that only works though if you only, if you interpret the world literally. Every, well, the, the child clearly wanted to throw a grenade. I don't think they really wanted to hurt anyone to throw a grenade, they were just playing a game, right? Um. Right, we go back to William Deere and the Dallas Egbert case and Patricia Pulling. So th this is talking about the, the panic over role. I mean, this I think is a key uh, paragraph here. The panic over role playing games was an extreme example of a larger pattern in which moral entrepreneurs ignore the frame of fiction and treat imaginary symbols and narratives as reality. William Deere obsessed over the content of Dallas Egbert's fantasy life to the exclusion of numerous more tangible factors. Yeah, that he had he was this kid was using drugs. That he was like living in he had squalor, all this kind of stuff, right? Uh, occult crime experts such as Patricia Polian insisted that occultism depicted in role-playing games was not a fiction but real. However, it was conservative evangelical critics who brought this line of thought to its ultimate conclusion, arguing that when players imagine monsters, they are actually having a supernatural encounter with literal demons, making this claim sort of sundered any meaningful distinction between imagination and reality. Um, but as with Alex and his imaginary great grenade, it is the critics, not the players, who seem to be struggling to, ne to negotiate between frames of reality. Um, do children who play Monopoly growing up, uh, this is a quote from uh, Gareth Medway's The Lure of the Sinister, do children who play Monopoly grow up to be property speculators? Does chess foster racial disharmony by setting up white against black? Because anti-Satanists cannot distinguish fans from reality, does that mean the rest of the population are similarly afflicted? Fair question. Um, yeah. But th this section was really interesting, um, and a lot of my, my students were like, yeah, they, they, this kind of broke down some issues for them that they really liked. Um, let's see here. Some of the students are shocked at how adults think about this stuff. And, th and once again, my students are kind of in that liminal space, too, between, um, which is kind of fun. So this is, this is like 
pretty relevant to them. Um. Yeah, and I kind of understand that there's there seems to be sort of squashing of, of the imagination in adulthood, and I I think that's a I think that's a really key takeaway here. This, these two are really interesting labeling um, and how that works. So that was chapter uh, seven. Uh, chapter eight, which is Rival Fantasies, which is a great name. Um, basically, chapter seven is like a big chapter. The Rival Fantasies um, opens up with a quote. Uh, from Iris Murdoch says, we live in a fantasy world, a world of illusion. The great task in life is to find reality. And also opens a quote from Gary Gygax that says, that a group playing a fantasy RPG will lose the touch with reality or become mind controlled is completely, completely uh, fictitious. This is obvious to any observer of or participant in RPG activity. Those who claim such an effect as possible are the ones that have lost touch with reality. And this is the key idea, is that, um, the moral entrepreneurs are the ones playing the game. They're the ones that create a villain and themselves or envision themselves as a hero and then need a villain to operate. That's the only way they work. Um, and it allows them to fulfill this kind of hero fantasy, uh, being these being this entrepreneur situation, this moral entrepreneur situation versus actually doing anything. They don't have to do anything. They're already the good ones. The evil's already out. And so the students are kind of catching on that. So here's like some stuff they wrote. Um, this is a quote they used. Gamers and their critics share a desire to construct a moral universe uh, to mentally inhabit. That's a really good quote. Um, so the gamers, when you play games, there's like the right, the wrong, uh, the correct and the incorrect kind of ideas. These kind of her heroics, you're the hero of the story. But these moral entrepreneurs do the same thing. A major point I took away from this chapter is that humans love to be engaged in imaginative activities, and the Titanic was merely conflicting fantasies that got out of control. In a way, the critics engaged in a corrupted play, what they did, uh, because they took their beliefs into the real world and indirectly hurt dozens of innocent people, or directly even for that matter, but they did hurt people. Um, and then a lot of this lays over to conspiracy theory thinking, which is what a lot of Titanic Panic was, it just wasn't called that because it was so mainstream. Um, Yeah, and how the criticism doesn't really reflect reality, but it, it stations them in a, in a position of uh, good, as, as privileged. I think that's a key element there. Uh, let me go into this one real quick. Let's see here. The arguments are similar from both sides. The difference, though, is that like, some are like, telling the truth and some aren't. That's a big deal. Um... Let's see here. Oh, they're, they're trying to find some better stuff here. Uh, trying to, the moral entrepreneurs trying to undermine the public good and form the public conspiracies is fact. That's a big thing. They, they try to say this. These are facts. Just, they don't make facts. People are looking to be the hero will outrageously lie or develop inaccurate details, such as being a high ranking government official to employ and narrow through their audience. But this, is, this was uh, William Deere. William Deere did this. Uh, he says that he does all the stuff and he really didn't do it. There's kind of an idea that they have to like cre create this narrative to justify their existence, which is really interesting. Um, this, yeah, the main, and the difference between the role players and the moral entrepreneurs in this case, like bowling and such, is that they're actually trying to bring their stuff in the world. I'm not trying to bring dragons. I'm not trying to make like myself a wizard. I'm not trying. I dress up like a wizard. I thought that I'm going to go and for tomorrow. But I'm not trying to like do any of this stuff. And where these other people are like saying that we are going to make this the situation. I don't know. They they got it pretty well. Uh, next week we're going to kind of have a mellow week. I might we might actually might, might actually watch a documentary. Um, I am having my students watch the first episode of Tabletop News. Uh, I watched this today. Uh, I have thoughts on it. I don't want to share them yet because I want my students. I don't want my my views on it to corrupt my students. But I'm, I'm 
I'm definitely, I was curious about that. I was definitely curious. And uh, my students are going to watch it. I don't know if anyone's, who's even, who's even responding to it? I'm curious. Uh, no. No. They, um, yeah, I had them, uh, they pulled the whole thing. Yeah, there it is. All that they haven't responded yet, but it's not due till, um, Sunday night, so they'll, they'll probably, I'll probably get them all Sunday night. Um, yeah, Chris, I appreciate it, man. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I, was, I, I talked to some people that were, uh, uh, Michelle DeWin Wynn saw me tweet about this time my students was excited, so I'd love to share those thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm really curious what they have to say about it. I think we're gonna do that. We're gonna share those thoughts on uh, uh, Friday. This my next Friday will be 10. Um, that should be pretty good. But my students are, um, I don't know, I, I, it, it's, I'm really curious. Like, I, have a, I have a very diverse audience and uh, student audience in terms of like their interests. And I can see, I can see them really, I couldn't tell you what they're gonna overall think. I really could. Um, I will say this, I think, I, I do think it'll appeal to a lot of them on the fact that it covers a diverse set of topics. I think I think that actually will will be something they're going to talk about. It's like, oh, is, I mean, just, they thought it was a new role playing game, Dungeons and Dragons. It's not, and so I think that's going to be one of the things. I, I have a feeling a lot of them are going to say that they're going to be surprised at that. So I think that'll be fun. Um, and uh, but I'm looking forward to, to talking about that. The other thing we might also do is uh, on we'll probably talk about that on Monday, and then on Wednesday we'll probably talk about Chapter Nine of Dangerous Games. And I'm, I know, man, I, I kind of want to show them. Um, I have a copy of it. and I watched it. But it's uh, Patrick Kilbane's uh, documentary with Guy Gax, which is really interesting because there's actually a lot of stuff in that I didn't, I never seen, I never seen the Guy Gax mansion in LA. That was like fascinating to see. That that's like shocking. I didn't realize he was. I knew he was living it up in LA, but I know he's living it up that. And so I'm really curious to kind of think about um, that element, and then uh, I also want to get them prepped up for D'Angelo's visit. And hopefully they got through Emer Emerald Templars. And I'm glad actually D'Angelo's visiting when he is because it gives him a nice break between having um, uh, uh, Steve uh, Canton Honor this week and other that. Um, and I would love actually to have them talk to some of the people from Tabletop News. That'd be actually a fun thing to follow up is watch the show and kind of talk about what's going on, what's the expectations. And what it is to work in a weekly medium too. Um, would be really curious so but anyways uh, i look forward to that we'll be doing that on friday next week uh i am back on tuesday night with abrax precipice a uh, very special episode this week i'm very excited about it uh we have returning uh jesse christensen who uh, is one of nasa's exo planet hunter planet hunter so finds planets out there uh, i believe she's found 66 planets already so she said i thought she's only doing she's only doing 25 i planet 66 my mistake jesse forgive me we had a blast play of those two weeks ago um in addition, at the same time, we're raising money for World Central Kitchen, uh, where Jesse has also promised to uh, match up to $500 in donations for that. So that's super cool. Um, so uh, if you haven't, um, I can actually put the link here if you want to put it there. There's the link for to donate to that. Um, and uh, we we'll plan with her again. And then lastly, it is Maria's last episode with us. Uh, she'll be leaving the show after this episode uh and uh we wish her the best to go focus on her game company goblin society games which is super cool uh, i'm very happy for her on that and i think what they're going to do with that it's going to be phenomenal uh they've been doing gen con they've been doing more and more cons promoting their games and i and i think they got some uh some kick-ass ones so i look forward to seeing what maria comes up with in the future and uh real real privilege to have them on the have them play with us for the last year and a half so but anyways guys hey look uh thanks for hanging out with me today i appreciate it all uh shout out to my boy tuck of iron uh thanks i had to wear your shirt today on the stream dude uh guys have a good weekend man i'm ready for tomorrow i'm gonna be, I'm gonna be burned out saturday night probably sunday so uh i'll recover i'll post, post the photos on social media for y'all hey you guys have a good one man take it easy uh go listen, go listen to some good music this weekend i'm about to go listen to some music. all right you guys take it easy man later you bet chris hey take it easy man <laughs>